Okay, well, I, we want to thank everybody to today's uh, webinar session on Pima County's Prosperity Initiative. Um, as the full name indicates, the initiative is a collaborative approach to addressing generational poverty. Um, my name is Tamara Prime. I'm a, a Chief Operating Officer for the Primavera Foundation in Tucson. And I also have the pleasure of being a 20 a uh, 14 um, member of the Flynn Brown Fellows Network, which is a uh, another program of the Arizona Center for Civic Leadership. And I'm going to moderate here today with my colleague, um, Julie Ketzel. Thanks, Tamara. I think we I want to join you in welcoming everyone. I know we still have panel. Uh, we still have participants coming in the room here. So Maybe we'll give it just another second here and we will keep going. We really appreciate the nearly 200 people that registered for this webinar today. So it takes a while to get everybody in the room. But with that, Tamara, do you want to maybe open us up again and then I'll introduce myself. I think we've got just about everybody in here now. Okay, sure. Uh, thank you again for joining us today for the um, Civics on uh, Pima County's Prosperity Initiative. We appreciate you tuning in and talking to us about it. And um, and I am Tamara Prime, the C Chief Operating Officer for Primavera Foundation in Tucson. So I'll be one of the co-moderators today. Great. Thanks, Tamara. And I'm Julie Katzel. Like Tamara, I'm a 2014 Flynn Brown Fellow. I'm currently the, the Assistant Vice President for Community Relations at the University of Arizona. And uh, Tamara and I want to welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. And we especially want to thank uh, the Flynn Foundation and specifically Don, Jennifer, and Danielle for hosting this CivX for us today. And, and for those of you who haven't joined a CivX before, the Arizona Civics Exchange, CivX, is a program of the Arizona Center for Civic Leadership. And its intent is to um, help Arizona's deepen their public service by grappling with difficult issues and exploring different viewpoints. And so that's exactly what we're going to do together today. Um, we're going to kick off the session with Bonnie Bazada, um, a presentation uh, from her. And Bonnie is uh, the champion of the initiative and has has really carried the seed of the the idea of this initiative to its current um, form. And so um, we'll hear from Bonnie, and then we will um, have a panel discussion with um, a couple of key community leaders who are also helping to carry the initiative forward. Yes, and thanks, Tamara. At this point, I'd like to introduce all the panelists that you'll be hearing from during the hour. Um, joining us will be the Vice Chair of the Pima County Board of Supervisors, Rex Scott, also Assisted City Manager for the City of Tucson, Liz Morales, uh, Keith Viscovi Ciordi, a 2023 Flynn Brown Fellow, and the Economic Development Director for Pima County, and also Tisha Tallman, the CEO of Primavera Foundation. Thank you all panelists for being here. So first we're gonna hear from Bonnie Vazada. Um, Bonnie is the Ending Poverty Now Program Manager for Pima County. And as Tamara said, Bonnie has been a champion for the Pima Prosperity Initiative from the very beginning, and she's now responsible for its implementation. So with that, Bonnie, I turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. And I'm so excited to be with all of you today. Um, they've trusted me with the technology here. So what I'm gonna do is bring up my PowerPoint presentation. Um, make sure I'm choosing the right screen. Does that look accurate to everybody? Okay, great. So again, thank you so much for this opportunity um, to talk about the Prosperity Initiative, which is a uh, regional effort to reduce generational poverty and improve community wealth. Um, so, you know, poverty is such a complex issue 
And there's so many different measures of it, so many different definitions of it. But the way I often think about it is that it creates this kind of ecology for people that's based on any number of different factors. Sometimes it's called social determinants of health. There's lots of different ways it gets measured. Here's some dashboards that choose different, uh, different components of poverty to, to look at and measure. But the, the thing is that the more factors you're, you're up against, the harder it is to get out of it. And the longer you're experiencing poverty, the harder it is to get out of it. And poverty is such a powerful force that I also think of poverty as environment. It has a tremendous impact on what shows up in people's lives. It often impacts where they live, where they go to school, where they worship with, who they worship with, what they do for a living, who's in their social support network, how healthy they are, and even how long a person lives. And the reality is because of these forces and factors, we end up living very economically segregated lives and often not really coming to know and understand each other. So the backdrop is that in Pima County, perhaps in your community, we have high poverty rates. We have historically had high poverty rates. And I know you can't see these maps uh, in detail, but here we are tracking by census tract uh, where we have rates of poverty. And so you can see that poverty is distributed um, differently across the county. And most importantly, that children are impacted more by poverty than any other uh, age group. And that should be a real concern to us. And, and we're gonna be coming back to that a number of times in today's presentation. And so we also need to disaggregate poverty uh, uh, measures in a number of different ways. One is by geography. So here again, you know, sort of based on the map you just saw, you can see that poverty is not equally distributed. We have very high poverty rates in cells, which is the capital of the Tonawanda Nation, or in South Tucson, and uh, lower poverty rates in in Marana and Oro Valley and other areas. Um, the University of Arizona's MAP dashboard compares Tucson, which in this case, Tucson often really means Pima County. It's a metropolitan statistical area that really captures a much uh, bigger geography than just Tucson. So they compare Tucson against 11 other Western cities. And you can see here that um, Tucson ranks number 10. Um, and then it's very important that we also disaggregate by race and ethnicity. So here we can see that, uh, again, um, communities of color, particularly Native Americans, are very much disproportionately impacted by poverty. And we can also see that Tucson tends to rank higher in, in, any, in all of these categories when compared against Arizona and the United States. Um, and so... Um, Neighborhoods, I'm going to come back to this, but as we talked about sort of that ecology and the environment, uh, one of the things we found in our research is that neighborhoods have causal effects on children's long-term outcomes. There's something about the conditions, the uh, again, this sort of um, complex set of factors in a, in a child's environment that can positively or negatively affect their outcomes. So here's what researchers say. There are four ways we can address poverty. We can prevent it. We can alleviate the suffering. We can aid the transition out of poverty and we can address stru structures. And so the Prosperity Initiative was really saying that in many of our communities and for lots of right reasons, we put a lot of emphasis on alleviating suffering. We don't want a family to be hungry. We don't want a mother to not have diapers for her children. We don't want to have people on the streets who are homeless, so we have emergency shelters. All of that is very good, not an argument to reduce those, but it can also take our attention and our resources away from some of the upstream solutions, which is really what the Prosperity Initiative is addressing. How can we also address prevention, aiding the transition and addressing structures? And I wanted to bring Raj Chetty into this conversation early for two reasons. One is um, he's my uh, economist superhero. Uh, he is responsible for the um, research around what's called Opportunity Insights out of Harvard. And this was um, 
a, uh, a compilation of uh, 20 million children between 1978 and 1983, um, looking at data that came together from uh, census and IRS data, and looked at these um, children over time, looking at in that 2000 and 2010 data to kind of tell us what, what's the progress. And with this huge big compilation of data, they're able to look for patterns and start determining some things that seem to be able to increase economic mobility. So we drew a lot on the work of Opportunity Insights. Um, but I also wanted to bring in his quote here because it's so easy to think of the complexity of poverty being something that can only be addressed at the state and the national level. But in fact, Chetty says, and we believe, that we can address intergenerational poverty at the local level. But in order to do that, we really have to be focused on policies and not just on sort of individual behavior. How do we strengthen and grow our, our economy and those certain elements that can influence um, economic mobility? So how did this get started? Well, I really want to credit um, then Vice Mayor, now Council Member Lane Santa Cruz. Um, she invited me to speak to mayor and council in April of 22 because we were all concerned about where are we as we're emerging from the pandemic. We know that often the people who are most vulnerable, who were low income, who had more health issues, were the hardest hit by the pandemic. And so what should we be thinking about? And so out of that meeting, um, mayor and council voted for a joint city county task force. It came to the county side. Uh, we had some conversations and we developed the Prosperity Initiative. Um, and I'm very excited to say that at the end of a, a long journey of developing these policies, both the Board of Supervisors and the City Council adopted the policies, which I'll be telling you about in just a minute. And so what we decided is um, that we needed a regional approach, right? We know we can see from those statistics that poverty doesn't st stop at a certain geographic level. Uh, boundary. So we wanted to invite all the governments in Pima County to participate. Um, and we wanted to have it be a policy focused. And we wanted those policies to be evidence-based. What could we really bring forward to our elected officials and to our community to say, we think these um, policies really give us the best chance of, of how we can address poverty. And I really wanna acknowledge that it was very much a city county collaboration from right from the beginning. We, we really work shoulder to shoulder um, in this process as, as well as other governments who come to the table. And so uh, what we ended up determining was that um, the areas in blue were, the, were really the indicators we were looking for in that evidence-based research um, that would either show that this policy could increase a parent's income or a child's income as an adult, decrease the household expenses, or increase and protect assets like home ownership. Secondarily, we often found and wanted to find that those policies could also improve the educational attainment of parent and child, improve the health of parent and child, um, potentially reduce crime, um, and uh, was there a return on investment? Um, we developed 12 or excuse me, 11 guiding principles. You can see them here. I won't go through all of them, but we, we kept um, checking out our, our research and our process against these questions, um, including is it applicable at the local government level? Is it supported by our community as well as by national experts? Uh, is it targeting the right parts of the community? And is it addressing um, historic uh, uh, and systemic inequities? And is it, what, what about rural and urban impact and then unintended consequences? And we knew we had to find policy that, you know, fit our toolbox, right? Again, we're not state and national. We don't have those levers, but we do have things we can do at our, our local regional level. So making sure the policies uh, would fit into our toolbox. And so, as I mentioned, we formed a regional working group um, and we met monthly. Uh, we had about 36 members who came together representing different, different governments, different departments. I uh, really want to acknowledge and thank the Tucson Indian Center for their participation as well. And we had two researchers, uh, Dr. Bentley and Dr. Meyer from uh, University of Arizona who did a, a, have extensive background in, in poverty and were, were extremely helpful to us and, and kind of guiding us and um, assisting us with the research. 
And we knew that community input was really important. Um, so we had over 180 meetings with more than 750 individuals, often people several times. We talked to uh, grass tops and grassroots. We talked to practitioners, to leaders. Um, and also we, we identified 33 policy centers and uh, spoke to a number of people at those national policy centers talked to some people at the state level. Uh, we looked at over 330 research articles um, and every policy was then reviewed by people who are expert in that area for feedback. We also made sure that we talked to all of our councils and commissions uh, in our area to also engage them and get feedback. And it, so it's probably no surprise and I wanna highlight that it came up over and over again in the research that children matter, right? If we are going to reduce generational poverty, then we really have to be focused on poli poli policies that affect the whole family, but particularly have impact on children. And we also um, were looking at this question of intergenerational poverty, right? This persistence of poverty, because um, uh, it shows that kids who grow up in poverty are twice as likely to stay in poverty as adults. And I wanna mention that we uh, drew strongly from a report from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine called Reducing Intergenerational Poverty. Um, and it, it uh, guided us, but also reinforced that we were uh, steering things in the right direction. And I wanna mention again that in particular, they noted that um, a, a focus needs to be placed on Black and Native American families and children who have much lower rates of upward mo mobility, higher rates of downward mo mobility, and are significantly more likely to grow up in high poverty neighborhoods. Um, so uh, that's something that we're really keeping in mind as we move forward in the implementation stage. And as I mentioned, and again, the research came up over and over again, that we need to have equitable solutions that address these historic systems, often policies that have driven uh, the, the disparities in poverty, particularly around race and ethnicity. And so we came up with really three policy areas and then what we're calling three cross policy strategies. So I'm going to briefly walk you um, through those uh, policy areas. We have two in education. So it was sort of low hanging fruit for us to choose early childhood education. We had already developed something called the PEEPS program. It's a early childhood scholarship program in Pima County, had done a lot of research around that. The return on investment is very strong um, in early childhood education. So that was our first policy. The second one had to do with post-secondary education. How can we open more doors and support more young people in moving into some level of post-secondary education? And so we found a lot of research that really focused on children's savings accounts as a place where you can begin that process of building not just the savings, but the family investment in making sure that their child can move into that post-secondary setting. Um, we had two on housing, and that's not surprising either. Uh, the first one really goes back to that Opportunity Insights data. that, And so it's around housing mobility and opportunity. And what it basically says that there's really strong research that when you can take a low-income family in a high poverty neighborhood and move it to move that family to a higher opportunity area, and again, you know, we're not talking gated communities, but a higher opportunity area, that there's significant impact on the family's health and then on the uh, educational attainment and earnings of that child, on average, $300,000 more over a lifetime than their peer who stayed in the low-income, high-poverty neighborhood. Um, and then housing stability, which really has to talk about uh, how we ad how we ensure that people stay housed, that we don't have a lot of evictions and homelessness, uh, that we can support people in home ownership and retaining homes, uh, weatherization, home repair programs, and particularly targeting high poverty areas. And on that note, just to say, many of the call may be aware of this, that Arizona is ranked among the five states for the worst affordable housing. So for every four fa families, um, that need uh, affordable housing, only one exists. 
And we see that in the Tucson area over the past three years, there's been on average almost a 40% increase in rent. So um, a, a, about 42% of our families in a recent survey show that they're paying more than half their income for rent. So we know this is very destabilizing. So staying focused, not just on the construction of affordable housing, which is very important, but also how to maintain housing for people today. And then we have two in health. One is to do with making sure people have health insurance and health coverage so that they can practice good preventative uh, health and health maintenance, but also as a way to reduce medical debt. And then reducing unintended pregnancies, very powerful research that shows the economic consequences of unintended pregnancies and the more that we can do to help women and families choose and time their pregnancies means better health and economic outcomes for the family. We have one in workforce, and, and while that might seem like an obvious choice, what the research told us, it's not just workforce as usual, uh, because half the jobs in Pima County are considered low-wage jobs by the Brookings Institution. So we can help people get into jobs, but are we helping them to get into self-sufficiency wage jobs? And so this is really about looking at a number of programs that combine more intensive case management, support systems to help uh, folks get through training and then land those and keep those better paying jobs. Digital inclusion is really about access to broadband, having the broadband there, but also being able to afford it to have the digital devices and have the digital skills to access that broadband. And it's really critical to everything from jobs to healthcare to civic engagement. And whoops, skip one there. Financial capability, the ability of people to, uh, to gain economic stability, but also gain and protect assets both individuals and small businesses, and then supporting small businesses and particularly women owned and entrepreneurs of color. So transportation is a pretty broad policy. It was interesting digging into that very complex research around that, but it's really about how to help uh, low income individuals be able to have the transportation they need to get to jobs and other resources while at the same time addressing things like uh, po air pollution, uh, traffic injuries, uh, traffic times, travel times. And then improving job quality for low-income workers, which again has to do with uh, self-sufficient wages, but also benefits, um, uh, uh, family-friendly um, environments and, and practices, and also consistent scheduling came up a lot. I could talk about that a lot. But you know how difficult it is if 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 an, if an employee doesn't have consistent scheduling and and the economic and health impacts of that. And then one that was really important to us and and um, Mayor Romero really wanted us to bring forward a neighborhood reinvestment policy. Uh, at first, it was a challenging because a lot of times those are infrastructure investments, and while they're important, lights, sidewalks, parks, we can't show that they reduce poverty directly. But we were able to to find again this causal research that said neighborhoods impact the outcomes for children, their health and well-being, their, their long-term uh, earnings from the conditions in these neighborhoods. And so, so this is really talking about investments we can make and particularly things like navigators and hubs that connect uh, uh, community members to the resources they need in real time. Um, and talking about using uh, the Child Opportunity Index as one of the measures of, of the health of a neighborhood. Um, how do we help with uh, prevention and reduction of crime in those neighborhoods? And, and any number of things we can do to help families stabilize and, and build economic stability. And then we have three cross policy strategies. And these were so important, we thought, as we looked into them, that they really cut across nearly all the policies. And that is a two generation or multi generation approach, which keeps the whole family in the picture as we're developing um, our different strategies, uh, but also bringing in family voice as we think about our different policies and practices. Then addressing climate resilience and environmental justice. We know that. Um, Climate change is often impacting most in the neighborhoods that are low income. Um, and so how do we address that as, long, as well as uh, some of uh, issues related to, to pollution? And then again, as I've mentioned, pre uh, preventing and reducing crime. And so 
the research was clear that bundling uh, these policies were important. And I wanna to mention too, that we went back recently and used these nine indicators, looked at each policy to see how many of those indicators were ranked. In other words, how strong were these policies? And uh, so we, we did an exercise of reviewing and checking all of that. And what we found was that these policies really do have a really strong foundation. Four of them checked all eight, five of them check seven, et cetera. You can see them down here. But again, uh, we feel like these are some very strong policies. And so we went to the supervisors and, and the council asking for a full acceptance of all 13 plus the three cross policy strategies, which happened and, and we celebrated. And so now what this does is it gives us a strategic framework. So one of the things we're doing is investigating where are we currently putting our resources and, and, our, and our money uh, are, are they in the right areas? Are there things we're missing? Can we better align our resources in coordination across departments, between governments, with our community partners? It'll help us guide our, our, our grant opportunities um, and identify what we're missing. Uh, what what evidence-based programs and strategies should we be bringing in and investing in that align with these policies? And um, so that's what we're doing now is we're doing this sort of a, a discovery and inventory um, and we will be financially tracking those things. We also have a research team and we were accepted as part of the National Urban Institute's Mobility Action Learning Network with 26 other cities and counties to look at how can we measure impact. We need to be able to know where we are and where we're going and to be accountable to, to our community for our, our investments. And then asking, you know, and how do we report that out? Do we do we use a dashboard? What indicators are we going to keep our eyes on? And then uh, we really appreciate our collaboration with the University of Arizona. They've been very involved up till now, but we're looking at other ways that we can continue to engage faculty and students um, in this in this work. And we know that it's really important to continue our regional partnership with with governments. We are looking at how we can develop a community collaboration that would work in tandem with governments on moving these policies forward and innovating and coming up with ideas across different sectors. And it's very important that we continue our, our engagement, our partnerships with our Native American tribes, uh, organizations, and community members. And so we're thinking about this in Pima County as sort of an equivalent of the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan that started 20 years ago with a commitment to how do we protect and utilize our natural environment so that it both serves our human needs, but is also here to protect our beautiful and fragile desert. And 20 years later, we've made a lot of progress. We've had a great deal of engagement um, and we have a stronger community for it. So we need that kind of long-term generational, I call it cathedral thinking, right? We need to invest knowing that we may not know the outcome of our investments, but we, we are, will continue as a community to build that investment. And we're really saying we have the opportunity to be architects of change for the next generation. And so that's what uh, we're committed to with the Prosperity Initiative. So with that, I will close um, and, and look forward to the panel. That's great. Thank you, Bonnie. That was outstanding. Thank you for that presentation and thank you for all the work that you're doing, have done and will continue to do for those of us in Pima County, but also potentially statewide because we know this is a model that could be adopted elsewhere and that's kind of why we're here. So we wanna share this with our colleagues and other interested parties statewide. Um, I know there were probably some questions for Bonnie if you have questions uh, for Bonnie or for any of our panelists, please enter them in the Q&A. And after we ask our panelists a question, we will open it up for your questions as well. So with that, let's uh, kick off our panel with Vice Chairman of the Pima County Board of Supervisors, Rex Scott. So Rex, thank you for joining us. And I'd like to ask you, can you tell us, I know that you are a supporter of the Pima Prosperity Initiative. So why did you think that the initiative was important for Pima County? And also a regional collaboration will be key to the success of the initiative. 
So why do you think that that is that the regional collaboration is important and how might it also be challenging? Julie, thanks very much for the question and I'm delighted to be part of this panel, especially since I get to work with uh, two of our exceptional staff members, Bonnie uh, and Heath. Uh, Bonnie, as you've al already seen, is the brains and heart behind the Prosperity Initiative, uh, but I could say the same about Heath with regard to our recently revised Economic Development Strategic Plan. Uh, I really think that this is probably going to be the most significant action that this board and subsequent boards take on, uh, and I described it when we passed it as a moral undertaking. Uh, not merely adopting a, a policy framework. And the reason for that is uh, in Pima County and, and throughout our country, the majority of people who live in poverty are children. And as Bonnie pointed out, uh, the greatest return on investment uh, comes from investing in our kids. And that is, again, not just um, a return on fiscal investment. It's a, a, it, it's a moral undertaking and, and, a, and a human investment. Uh, Bonnie referred to the two-generation approach, and another way of describing that is the whole family approach, because we can't really help kids uh, to get out of poverty if we're not first uh, helping their children. And as Bonnie pointed out, a significant percentage of, of kids who grow up in high-poverty households are in high-poverty households when they're adults. And so our focus is on increasing household income and assets and decreasing household costs. Uh, that, that's particularly critical in Pima County because before the pandemic, half of the jobs in the county were low wage. And, and uh, if that was the case before the pandemic, I think after the pandemic, the situation is probably even more dire. Uh, and while we're talking about a policy framework, not necessarily a set of uh, programs, when we do start investing in programs that come about as a result of this policy framework, uh, we have data that shows that every for every dollar that is spent on reducing childhood poverty, uh, we save at least seven more dollars. So this is not just, um, a, again, a humane and moral undertaking. It is also going to be an economic boon to the county and, and, and the other jurisdictions. Uh, the policies that, that we came up with were guided by a, a set of principles. There were nine overall, but I really wanted to highlight three of them. Uh, one was that policies must focus on reducing generational poverty as opposed to only alleviating the suffering of those experiencing poverty. Another one said that policies must be applicable at the local government level. Uh, and a third is that policies must be informed by local service providers, experts, committees, and commissions, and those in our local area with lived experience. So we're really looking for research-based approaches that are informed by what we hear uh, from people in our community as far as their needs are. Uh, we are so interconnected as a region in terms of how we work, how we play, how we shop, how we travel. Uh, that it is absolutely essential that we take a regional approach to implementing the policy uh, framework that is the Prosperity Initiative. And if you look at the page on the county's website, you'll see the logos of uh, all of our cities and towns, uh, the nation, the tribe. Uh, and what's great about the policy framework that uh, we adopted is that any of our local jurisdictions can... Um, take whatever they want from the policy framework and apply it to uh, fit their local circumstances. There's going to be a lot of collaboration, not only uh, between the cooperating jurisdictions, uh, but also between our partners in the private and nonprofit sectors. And I'm very excited with what we're going to be doing with the Urban Institute uh, and the Aspen Institute. So, uh, I, I appreciated the analogy with the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan as one of our uh, Deputy County Administrator said this is a, a, a marathon, not a sprint, uh, but I'm excited with everything that can be accomplished by applying this uh, policy framework and very proud to have supported it. Thank you, Supervisor Scott. And um, Heath, I wonder if you could expand on um, the Supervisor's comments related to how this is an economic issue and, and um, what are some of the costs of, of poverty in Pima County? 
Yeah, no, of course. Uh, so number one, I would like to say thank you to Supervisor Scott for the kind words and honestly to Bonnie for honestly being the heartbeat of this entire thing and allowing our department to have input with it as well. Um, it's lovely to hear and to see parts of, of what we're doing in economic development come to life within this initiative. Uh, long before I was here, uh, one of the points of this department was to reduce poverty and to help reduce poverty. Um, and since I came here, we're really focusing on that upward e economic mobility track too. Um, and to have those things incorporated is extremely heartening, right? Um, the cost of poverty, Bonnie sent me a, a pretty striking number that in any given year, you're looking at a cost of poverty in the Tucson MSA of about $3 billion, right? Um, in 2022, there was $2.8 billion worth of direct travel spending into the county. Um, and another comparative that I think is unique to look at is when we recently attracted American Battery Factory, which is a $1.2 billion investment, the economic impact over 10 years is $3.1 billion. So what we're seeing with generational poverty and poverty in general is that the cost vastly outweighs or offsets in some instances the amount of work that we're doing from just the pure economic development perspective. Um, so investing right into the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, the human infrastructure is absolutely critical. When we look at workforce development components, right, and how to place people in career-oriented high-wage jobs so that they can avoid poverty, um, it's, it's interesting because we have taken a, a relatively traditional approach to it. But we've started to intermingle those things and communicate, I think, more adeptly, not only among our departments internally, but with our external partners as well. And so we're coming to the realization, right, that it's not just about who's working age now and who we can upskill to put into a job that may or may not be available, but it's about looking at the next generation and the generation thereafter. And the PEEPS program is an amazing uh, example of that. Investing in young individuals early on puts them in a much better position to be able to learn, to be reskilled, recertified, trained, to take these jobs that are developing so quickly. Um, it's the other component, too, that Supervisor Scott and, and uh, Bonnie mentioned, which is the amount of, quote unquote, low wage jobs in Pima County. We are traditionally known as a low wage job area. Um, in, in fact, myself, Bonnie and our deputy director were chatting with an individual about that preconceived notion about the county and what that means for us um, and what we're trying to do to alleviate that. Right. And so the traditional economic development approach, we're trying to attract those higher wage jobs and couple it with the workforce development component, but there's much more to it than that. And the prosperity initiative is the thing that really turns traditional economic development on its head and allows us to rethink what we're doing, not only within this department, but within what our regional collaborative ecosystem looks like. And I am now evaluating what state level policy looks like, what federal level policy looks like, and what our local economic development policy looks like, not only within our county, but within the cities and the surrounding towns, unincorporated areas, to see how we can maneuver some of these things to, I think, more greatly affect what Bonnie is really trying to aim at here. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of workforce development. PCC does an amazing job. JTED does an amazing job. U of A, bar none, right? Second to none. But looking at education, looking at critical family resources, looking at asset building and infrastructure, both human and physical, and those cross-policy strategies, putting those together and actually implementing those things and creating that through data-driven research is going to be something that will have that 20, 30, 40, 50-year effect that we're looking at. Um, so I'm, I'm very heartened with where things are going. Again, very thankful to have been able to be a small part of what this huge undertaking is um, and looking forward to continuing our work, coupling that up with Bonnie, working with the leadership of both the Board of Supervisors and the Council to attract these higher opportunity jobs for individuals and making sure that we all have upward economic mobility and po poverty reduction throughout the county. Thank you, Heath. Appreciate that uh, perspective. It's not one many people might have expected to hear uh, on this webinar, but the economic impact is so important. We really do appreciate your participation. But I'd also like to uh, turn it over to the Assistant City Manager for the City of Tucson, Liz Morales. Thank you for joining us. And um, can you tell us why adopting the Pima Prosperity Initiative was important for the city to do? And how does the initiative support the city's programmatic and policy efforts um, 
and, and why is it important to the city to participate? Thank you, Julie. Um, you know, one of the things I wanna just start off by saying I'm a big Bonnie fan too. I think we should give her a PhD because she read so much research I think she has uh, has probably earned her doctorate in doing all of this. Um, but I just have to give my thanks to Bonnie for all her work. Um, you know, why, why would the city want to adopt? I will say, um, when I first came to the city, I came in as um, the director of housing and community development. And one of the things that the uh, Mayor Romero, at that time, um, she was running for mayor, and she told me, What's really important to me is that we get to the root causes of homeless uh, of poverty. And I, my first thought was, I think that's out of my my job duty. I, that's that's bigger and higher than I could even put my try to wrap my head around. Um, I was all about housing, and so it felt like a tall order. And so it was, I was so re, so um, appreciative when Bonnie started talking about some of the, the work around anti poverty. Um, measures and initiatives, and I thought, okay, we can we can do this. There is things out there um, that we can do. And and when Councilmember Santa Cruz invited Bonnie, that was what got the ball rolling to get us to start talking. You know, one of the things, um, you know, COVID, as we all know, had um, brought some incredibly scary and and terrible times, but it also brought incredible partnerships and opportunities um, around, and I, I think of Primavera and Bonnie and the work they did around eviction prevention, um, also around um, our COVID response for helping with emergency rental assistance programs. And um, we, we just did a lot of putting people into hotels that were unsheltered, who were vulnerable and high risk of contracting the, the virus. When we work together, the city and the county, um, a lot, a lot of good can come, and we've proven that. And so, working together on the prosperity initiative, I think, is just that next step around shared mission about how do we do this regionally, as Supervisor Scott talked about. How can we do this, and what what do we do well? Um, where the county does really well uh, is a lot. So, as an example, public health. Um, there's a lot of great work there. Um, and on the city side, you know, we can do other things um, like housing where, you know, we do, we actually operate a lot of the housing programs on behalf of Pima County. So, you know, this prosperity initiative allows us to say, okay, here are 13 policies um, and three other cross cutting that where is it that we um, can best use our resources. And so one of the things we're doing is in taking inventory of all the work that we're doing that serves those families and children that um, we could implement some of these policies to help improve their, their situations, to help move them out of poverty and it really into uh, prosperity. And so um, I, the, the push that we have now is let's figure out what, we, what we're doing are we using the best practices or what additional programs, how do we invest um, our, our, whether it's general funds or federal investments or go out for new federal uh, funding opportunities? How can we do that so we can zero in and be very strategic? And so um, that those are the ways that the city has committed. And, and I really want to say committed because uh, it's a mutual commitment. Um, again, the, the county did a lot of the, the work um, to organize us, but we all worked on this uh, together with a commitment to see this through and to measure impact. Now we have this opportunity, the mobility initiative. So we, this is, a, this is our plan for long-term to do this collectively and not just as government, because government can only do so much, but with our community providers like Primavera and, and other um, uh, our local businesses, we know that there are people who want to participate in this and help us um, make some progress in this area. Our schools, um, we just have a lot of partners and a lot of potential. So that's why we're doing it. And, and we're going to be doing this for a long time. Thank you, Liz. 
you know, Tish, I'm, I'm wondering if you could um, speak to a couple of things that we at Primavera spent a lot of time talking about, on, um, which is that while we're um, visioning for the future, it's still really important to not neglect um, addressing immediate needs. So I wonder if you could talk about that. But then also as people start to um, uh, uh, move up and economically and 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 demonstrate some mobility in their lives what are what is the uh racial equity context around some of that work too yeah thank you very much Tamara and 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 thank you to Pima County and the city of Tucson and and Arizona Center for Civic Leadership um it's a great pleasure to be a part of this discussion it's, it's so imperative and when I really think of this issue you know it's really a, a human capital investment issue, right? We invest in infrastructure, we invest in healthcare, um, and we need to invest in people. Um, the urgency around this issue is so palpable. I think um, everyone in this community, Tucson, South Tucson, Pima County, Saurita, um, all the surrounding area, um, it's very real, it's very palpable, the type of uh, level and extent of poverty um, in Tucson and South Tucson. I don't think any of us know anyone, whether it's within our families, our neighborhoods, our communities of people struggling right now, financially, economically, um, and we deal with it on a regular basis. Um, our reality is not only uh, dealing with folks on the brink of poverty or in poverty, but in extreme poverty, um, living on the streets. So, you know, the immediacy and urgency around um, our current situation is something that started pre-COVID, right? We saw that income inequality within communities um, was generating large amounts of uh, poverty, extreme poverty, and folks teetering on the brink of poverty. And then COVID just exacerbated that situation. You know, so now we're sitting at um, extremely high rates of poverty in our communities, in particular in Tucson and South Tucson, uh, where the average, the national average of one in three women who head households are living in poverty is even higher in Tucson than the average of one in three, um, where 40% of individuals in certain parts um, who experience childhood poverty will remain in poverty. Um, that's such a huge number. And then, you know, even outside of the poverty numbers, we have uh, the reality that from 2018 to 20. 23 um, here in Pima County, uh, our overall ho homelessness has increased by 60%, 200% of those individuals being an, an, an increase over that period of time of experiencing chronic homelessness and um, a 300% increase in folks who are unhoused. So certainly the need is urgent. Um, getting at some of those upstream solutions, those policy solutions outlined in prosperity initiative are extremely noble and have to be done. But simultaneously, we need to work to create um, options for individuals and families who are currently struggling economically. And that needs to be something different, right? Poverty by America, Matthew Desmond says that we've been putting money into trying to alleviate poverty for 50 years and we have not significantly moved the needle. So, you know, these types of partnerships, city, county, community, organizations um, are imperative to try something new. And I think, you know, one of the things that we've learned from the various scholars and frameworks that we see popping up throughout the country is that this notion of participatory belonging, right? We need more people involved in the conversation who are directly impacted by what's happening in our communities. But we also need to, to create that, that belonging piece, right? The quality of life piece that Bonnie was talking about in her slides, right? The things that make us human. Because the reality is we not only need to alleviate the suffering that's happening currently to get us towards those solutions or those upstream uh, upstream solutions, um, that we need to address all the trauma that our communities are undergoing currently. So it's not just about, you know, uh, making water available, making showers available, making food available, making shelter available, but it's also about addressing the trauma that all of our communities are going, um, are carrying. Um, so it's, 
you know, some of the things that we've been talking about, home and belonging, it's the arts, it's poetry, it's community gardening, right? It's like thinking about things from a holistic approach in body, mind, and soul, and how are we addressing those uh, options for individuals um, seeking some economic stability, specifically on the, the, the equity lens, um, you know, we are very driven by the equity lens, the dignity lens, trauma-informed lens, um, and a participatory and belonging lens. And that's just to acknowledge that our historical past, um, including here in Tucson and Pima County, and our structural um, past, our institutions, uh, have included things such as redlining, such as uh, racist covenants, uh, uh, most recently, uh, our Mexican-American community was targeted nationally for subprime loans. Uh, many in our community uh, bore the brunt of foreclosures in 2008 with the housing and global and financial crisis that occurred. Um, so, you know, there are real, real things. And then there's, you know, we also know uh, La Calle um, was... Uh, uh, disseminated, right? So there are 80 acres um, in Tucson that at one time um, was uh, completely dispersed and created a community development, um, which displaced not only space and place and economy that existed at that time called La Calle, but also cultural uh, displacement. So there are a lot of real structural things that were specifically related to communities based on race and ethnicity, um, where we now still see low opportunity areas, high vulnerability areas. So then co something like COVID just exacerbates that um, and uh, we see uh, more uh, high vulnerability areas and low opportunity areas. And we know that you know our shelters and our programs are in those areas as well. Thank you, Tisha. Appreciate that. At, at this point, let's open this up for some questions uh, from the participants. I don't know if I, I'm unclear if everyone can see the questions that are being asked. I know the panelists can, but I'd like to start with one question and actually use it as an opportunity to just briefly talk about the university's partnership. Um, I'll tell you what we really appreciate. Bonnie mentioned that a couple of our scholars were involved early on in the formation of the policy initiative, but what I appreciate is the structure around 13 specific policy efforts that we can then send out to our scholars and to our students and say, do you see your work in one of these 13 areas? Do you want to engage with the community in one of these 13 areas? And then we can begin to collect uh, input from, from the uh, university community and connect them to Bonnie. Sometimes there are existing initiatives underway that she can just plug these people into. Or sometimes I think there could be new opportunities created because of the uh, expertise of folks who are coming forward. And so I use that kind of as a backdrop for a question that's in uh, that's been submitted. This is a very specific question about Pima animal care and how um, some of the people living and experiencing poverty have pets and they need support as well. But I think the broader question is, if there are people participating today who see themselves as having expertise in one of these areas or wish to know more about one of the 13 policy initiatives, how do they engage? How do they let you know that they would like to participate? And so Bonnie, I'll start with you if you've got some thoughts on that. Well, I'm happy, you know, for anyone to reach out um, and I'm, I'm sure my email uh, contact is somewhere in the presentation today. And um, our website is a great place. I just responded to a couple of questions that have been in the chat. Um, 
And so just to tell you, we have a, what is it, 280 page report, <laughs> but uh, the first part is sort of an overview. The second part is a summary of all 13 policies and the appendix are the technical briefs and they're pretty long and detailed. So if you're someone who really likes a lot of investigation and research, read the technical briefs, but if you just want to read the summaries, they're there too. Um, but I'm happy to, you know, respond. I'm happy to talk to groups. Um, you know, it's it's important that we all learn together and and uh, share this information. So please feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm happy to engage. Thank you, Bonnie. I, Julie, I just wanted to jump in because I had a, a question and a thought. I, I think that there are quite a few folks that are um, other that are Flynn Brown fellows, but also that um, are listening in from across the state. And um, I don't know if uh, maybe supervisor could respond to this. Are there places in which um, uh, a nexus of state policy or areas in which the the state policies need to be addressed so to um, uh, make way for some of the prosperity initiative? Well, one of the things that I said when we uh, passed the prosperity initiative is that it certainly is the responsibility of all levels of government uh, to deal with issues that impact intergenerational poverty. Uh, but our focus with the Prosperity Initiative is what can be accomplished locally. Uh, now, the county uh, every year has a uh, legislative program uh, that we not only uh, send to the legislature, but we have a lobbying team that uh, advances uh, the, that program for us uh, with the members of the Arizona House and Senate. Just like the Prosperity Initiative is going to have ramifications for our budgetary decisions and our resource allocation decisions, I expect it will also have ramifications on what that legislative program looks like and what we're asking our lobbyists uh, to advocate for with the members of the House and Senate. I hope that's responsive to your question, Tamara. Completely. Thank you. Thank you. I see we only have a few more minutes, so, and I know um, Bonnie probably has some wrap-up thoughts for us, but let me see if I can get a couple questions in here quickly. Uh, what kind of resistance did we have in Pima County for the adoption of this policy? Uh, was there organized opposition, and if so, how did you overcome that? I'm happy to say there was just I've just experienced tremendous support. You know, we we went out again, had lots of conversations um, from uh, nonprofit leaders, the chamber, uh, educational leaders, health leaders, um, people with lived experience. And we got lots of great questions, you know, good ideas, uh, interrogation. Um, we talked with council members, with supervisors. You know, so many people helped shape it. It was um, uh, and and pushed on different ideas and 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 research to look at and whatnot. But uh, I I'm really delighted at how much support there is across sectors. I think you know when you really take a look at it, it makes sense from an economic point of view, from an educational point of view, from health, um, and and as a moral undertaking. So. Uh, it opposition may come, it, you know, maybe that that's going to happen when we get more into the details of this, but um, I'm delighted that we have really had just very broad support. I'll ask, there's, I, we're not going to be able to get to all the questions, so I'll just let you know that now, unfortunately, but let me ask you about um, a, an issue that was not addressed in the prosperity initiative, and it's the access to mental health care. And so it's kind of a two-part question, like, why is that not in there, if, if there is a reason? And what about other things that people who are participating today may realize are significant, could have significant impact, but didn't make it into the prosperity initiative? Does that mean that they're, they weren't identified as important? Or um, what is the criteria for what made it into the initiative? So uh, we were tasked with five to 10 policies. We did come up with 13. We had a timeline, you know, of, of getting it done. And as I mentioned, they, they were, we were asked to find uh, evidence-based 
research around those really those three economic indicators of increased income for child or parent, uh, decreased health household expenses, or um, gaining and protecting assets, right? So um, there are lots of wonderful things we can and should be doing. Mental health, we know is so important com coming out of the pandemic in particular. Uh, and there's limitations to research. You know, social science research is limited by lots of things, including where the money comes from and who's doing it and all of that. So given the parameters of all of that, um, we, we couldn't find research that said these mental health inter interventions will result in increased income, decreased household expenses, or gaining and protecting assets. That doesn't mean mental health isn't incredibly important. And we should be doing, you know, lots of things to support that. But, um, and, and, and so, you know, again, for better or worse, those were our, our guidelines. And I think it did allow us to really identify 13 very strong um, measures. And as I noted, many of them have a very positive health outcome as well. Um, you know, and I, I, I could go into it in more detail, but I ran a program called MAMA and it was an intervention for low-income moms, and we helped increase their stability. And one of the things we we're able to measure is they reported fewer days of poor mental health as a result of that. So I firmly believe that if we can help families and individuals stabilize economically, it will have a positive mental health outcome. So I think it, it it can serve that end. And it also is not an argument to uh, not invest in important mental health services as well. That's great. I, I think we are out of time. So uh, thank you all. Bonnie, I don't know if, did you have some closing words or shall we just wrap this up and thank everyone? Just so much gratitude to Flynn Foundation, the Arizona Center for Civic Leadership, our panelists, and to all of you who are listening today and for your interest. And, and I just hope that um, what we're doing here in Pima County can, can support you in your community. And we're all in this together and look forward to, um, to our 20 year investment. Great, thank you, Bonnie. Thank you everyone for participating. Thank you.